Thanks to everybody who's taking time out of their day to learn a little bit more about Georgia O'Keeffe and just to revel in her amazing imagery. So uh, we have a lot to cover tonight, but let's just get started acknowledging that Georgia O'Keeffe is really the most famous woman artist on the planet, even today, um, you know, decades after her death. And when we think of Georgia O'Keeffe, we tend to think about her flower paintings, right? Well, out of her entire body of, of, um, of painting over a eight decade long career, Georgia O'Keeffe painted about 2000 works and she only painted about 200 flower paintings. So about 10% of, of her body of work is flower painting. So we're kind of doing her a disservice by not looking at the rest of what she did during this very long life and career that she had. Before I move away from this slide, I just wanted to acknowledge what a beauty it is. We get almost a little bit of a hint of a flower here, but these are just wonderful abstractions. We'll see some of these forms again and again tonight. This is called uh, Blue and Green Music from 1921. So let me um, get started. We're not getting started with our program overview. I am going to give you a quick flower fix before we get started. Just sort of thinking about the power of these images. And um, what we're looking at now is called Red Kana from 1924. It's in a private collection. It's just, it's it's magnificent, isn't it? Uh, it's a truly intimate look at a flower. I mean, we feel like we are right inside these petals and it's on a nearly monumental scale. It's a, a, almost three feet tall. So truly, flowers had never been painted like this before Georgia O'Keeffe. And what she's doing differently with, uh, with a work like this is she's describing for us in this great detail every ripple, every fold, and all of these elements, all of these lines take us to new forms and to new colors. And all of a sudden, in this red flower, we're discovering the lavenders, the yellows, the oranges. It's just a, a really incredible and sort of crisp and clean piece at the same time. There's so much description here. It's just truly gorgeous. Now, um, I think we have to acknowledge that for centuries, flower painting, it wasn't totally relegated to female artists, but it was certainly considered a feminine subject for a, a still life painting. And so floral still lifes, and I think sort of by uh, extension, floral botanicals became the realm of female artists, uh, largely. The image on the left over here is painted by a female artist from the early 1700s. Her name was Rachel Roish. Actually, she was uh, kind of a standout during her day, it, just in terms of being a female artist. Uh, but you can see, I mean, the, before George O'Keeffe, the approach to flower painting was to show a variety of florals in, um, in every possible stage of, of blossoming. So we've got buds, we've got uh, flowers that are wilting and dying, and, um, and to create this real kind of visual interest in harmony. And George O'Keeffe um, sort of crops and zooms in and provides us a very different perspective. But I think it's important to just kind of consider for a moment. Uh, George O'Keeffe is the most famous female artist on the planet, and she's famous for these flower paintings. And would she have ever become as famous if she didn't take up this traditionally kind of feminine subject matter? This is a female artist staying in a lane that was sort of designed for women artists in so many ways. So what we'll consider tonight are Georgia O'Keeffe's very real struggles in terms of expectations for women um, in terms of their gender role in society, in marriage and in careers. I mean, this is like a really modern question in terms of how women negotiate all of these things. How do they have a family? How do they have a career? I mean, before Georgia O'Keeffe, there weren't a lot of female artists that had to deal with this. And certainly virtually every, every woman today has to, has to wrangle with these subjects. So it's also, um, important to note that Georgia O'Keeffe never wanted to be known as a woman artist. So uh, she just wanted to be known as an artist. But just considering uh, the fact that she was, you know, all the setbacks she was up against working in a male dominated society and the very fact that she was still legally a second class citizen when she began painting. I mean, she, women didn't have the right to vote. Um, I think it's worth looking at and think, looking at her work and, and keeping in mind that she was a woman 
working against the grain in so many ways. All right, so we're going to end our brief little flower fix tonight with just two more gorgeous images here. Um, this is two calla lilies on pink from 1928 on the left. And over here on the right, we have white iris 1930 from the, uh, uh, which is in the Tate, London. I could live with these two pictures forever. They're just, they're elegant, they're soft, they're smooth, they're really wonderful. There was a, a critic who was contemporary to George O'Keefe who once described the feeling for us as humans to be looking at these paintings. And he said something uh, roughly akin to this notion that these flower paintings make us all feel like butterflies sitting on the petals of these paintings. And ever since I read that, that's how I imagine experiencing these works. We're just kind of resting right there. Um, so George O'Keefe had talked about, you know, the reason she painted these flower paintings is because she, she literally wanted us to kind of stop and smell the roses and consider nothing else for a moment except for these beautiful forms. So tonight we have the opportunity to take the time to cherish what she's created and to consider the things we might normally overlook. So flower paintings got Georgia O'Keeffe noticed. <laughs> and by 1928, she was so like so incredibly successful. It's it's almost hard to have perspective on it. By, but by the mid 1920s, she was able to sell a series of six flower paintings for over three, the equivalent of $300,000 in today's money. So that is not a bad payday and that far exceeds um, what most male artists were making at the time. All right, so now let's finally turn our attention to how we'll move through the material tonight. We'll turn our, our attention away from the flowers momentarily. And um, we'll start off with an introduction to the artist. This is a photograph of her by her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. We'll be hearing a lot more about him too. This is from 1932. So she's about 45 years old here. And I just love this kind of wry knowing smile on her face. And then after we get to know her, we're just going to skip right over the flowers and head to New York um, and look at her skyscraper paintings and then head west to New Mexico and look at her paintings of the desert, wrap up with her experiments in a variety of media towards the end of her life, and then finish up with her late works and legacy. So plenty to cover. All right. So just to get us oriented, Georgia O'Keeffe was born in 1887. So she was a teenager sort of blossoming into the world herself um, right around the turn of the century. She was born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, and this was the family homestead. Her parents were dairy farmers. She was the second in a family of seven children, and she was the first daughter. We see her at the center here with uh, in a photograph with uh, several other sisters. Now, um, she and many of her, her her siblings were um were sort of interested and, and generally inclined toward the, towards the arts. And so her parents encouraged that. So even as George O'Keefe was a young woman, a teenager, her parents were um, making sure that they got classes and special training in drawing and in watercolor. This is a drawing that she did when she was about 13 years old that's in the collection of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. This is a photograph of her from a little bit later on in life, but it's, it's, I think it's just kind of cool to see her sitting there with her materials and, you know, closely studying nature here too. So, um, so I think what's important to know about her as she's sort of transitioning from her teen years into her early 20s is that um, she did a lot of traveling. She was kind of all over the United States um, from the Northeast to the Southwest and back again. She had various, uh, well, she had great training. She went to the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago and to the Art Students League in New York City. And she kept sort of launching her career uh, primarily as an art instructor in various parts of the country. And then it always sort of seemed to get, um, well, she was always hindered by, uh, by an illness. And so that would send her home, her family relocated to Virginia. So she kept going back to Virginia. Um, she had measles, she had typhoid fever, and I guess she was sort of generally in, in poor health. So whenever she got sick, it, she kind of had to set restart on, on, her, on her career. Now, one of the things that she enjoyed and, and did for four summers straight beginning in 1912 was a special summer program at the University of Virginia, and it was designed specifically for women art 
educators. So she was in her element, so to speak. She liked it so much that she began going as a student and then ended up helping teaching, te teaching classes. So while she was there, she was exposed to the ideas of an art educator and philosopher named Arthur Wesley Dow. And essentially being exposed to his ideas was revolutionary in terms of her artistic practice. Dow's ideas were, was that artists didn't have to slavishly try to copy nature and or the world around them as they observed it. Instead, artists, their role should really be about design and composition. Artists had to make choices. And for George O'Keefe, this was really liberating. So even these images that she was creating around the campus of the University of Virginia, you can see that she's playing with abstraction. She certainly really likes symmetry, um, but she's you know simplifying forms here. She's making design and composition decisions. So from there, uh, one of the most consequential things, perhaps the most consequential thing that happens in her career is um, she she kind of dabbles in creating some drawings and some charcoal uh, drawings in um, it, it, right around 1915, 1916. And these are some of those works. Uh, they're in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is exactly how she looked in, in 1915. Now she sent these drawings to a friend who then sent them on to a gallery in New York City uh, named 291. That was the name of the gallery. And the gallery owner, who was Georgia O'Keeffe's future husband, she didn't know it, uh, he was just uh, sort, of, sort of taken aback by these images. He had never seen anything like it. He was getting really excited about them. And it started this um, relationship of letters between Georgia O'Keeffe and her future husband. And even after they got married years later, they still wrote to each other all the time. And over the course of 30 years, I, I think the total was like 25,000 pages of correspondence between the two of them. I always think that if they were alive today, they'd be the kind of couple that's like constantly texting each other. I think they understood each other best um, in the, through the written word. So um, George O'Keefe wrote to him before she had even met him. She said, I'm getting to like you so tremendously that it sometimes scares me. Having told you so much of me more than anyone else I know, could any Anything else follow, but that I should want you. Um, so Alfred Stieglitz is pretty taken with this beautiful young woman who has this kind of uh, uh, interesting artistic perspective. So let's turn our attention to her husband for just a moment, her future husband. This is Alfred Stieglitz, uh, a photograph of him from the same year, uh, 1915. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this is him standing in, in his gallery. Now, just a quick note, um, in terms of his kind of outsized influence in American art at this point. This little gallery that he was a part of um, and really running helped to first uh, promote this notion that photography could be an artistic medium and not a documentary medium. Can you imagine this? We take it for granted today that photography is artistic, but, um, but even into the 20th century, I mean, people didn't think of it that way. So first he's promoting that idea and he's the photographer himself. Next, he starts bringing in and exhibiting the work of European modern masters, Picasso, Cezanne, Matisse, they're all there. And so, you can imagine he's developing quite a following. And from there, he begins to exhibit the work of American modernists. Art, uh, artists like Arthur Dove and Marsden Hartley, um, John Marin were all on view there. And he was the person who was kind of pulling all the strings. He had all this incredible influence. Now, I don't know much about his personality, but I will just share with you this one line from an art historian that said, Stieglitz was an immensely charismatic person, amazingly eager egotistical and narcissistic, but he had this ability to establish a deep communion with people. So, I mean, this is a good guy to have on your side if you're trying to launch a career as an artist. There's just a few wrinkles here. Um, Alfred Stieglitz, at the time that he met Georgia O'Keeffe, was married, and he was also 23 years older than her. <laughs> but he was so taken with her that in 1918, he um, pays for Georgia O'Keeffe to move and move to New York City and to live there. So he's basically underwriting her painting for an entire year. 
But within weeks of her arrival, and this is exactly how she looked that year. These are photographs of her by him in 1918. Within weeks of her arrival, she gets a mysterious illness, another illness that kind of knocks her sideways. It's 1918, so I have a hunch that it was probably the Spanish flu. So she's um, she is an invalid. She's weak. She's practically bedridden. So um, out. Alfred Stieglitz takes on this outsized role in her life. He's like um, her landlord, her um, her artistic patron, and he's also like a nurse to her. And so it establishes this sort of interesting power dynamic in their relationship. Uh, but he uh, he sort of holds himself back for at least the summer, and he just focuses on um, photographing her, even though he really desires her. And so he has these, you know, this famous interest in her hands and her elegant long fingers. And you can tell she's really good at kind of posing these these fingers, which are, you know, the source of um, of all of her creative work as well. So these are photographs from 1918 and 1919 that are in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. So they waited long enough. George O'Keefe starts feeling better. Alfred Stieglitz can't hold himself back and they begin a romantic affair while he is still married. And he begins to take photographs of her nude. Um, George O'Keefe described this experience. She said uh, that he photographed her with a with a kind of heat. <laughs> so you can imagine there was it was these were steamy sessions for the two of them. Well, Alfred Stieglitz goes and does something that was pretty unprecedented for the day. He went and took these photographs and he exhibited them publicly. Now there's a real sort of difference. There's a split in the art world. I think most people are sort of comfortable seeing a painted nude that seems sort of artistic, that seems sort of safe, but there's something about a photographed nude that seems much more immediate and maybe a little bit more risque. Um, even in recent memory, we can think of somebody like Robert Maplethorpe and, and his, his nude imagery, I mean, set people on fire. So, um, so you can imagine there was a total scandal over these images. There was a controversy. People couldn't stop talking about them. They were really interested in this young woman that Alfred Stieglitz was painting. And, um, and from there, a star is born. These nude photographs really helped to launch her career. And so from then on, essentially her husband or her soon to be husband exhibits her work every single year. He's really dedicated to her career. In fact, he takes kind of an outsized role in managing managing her career. So in 1923, she, um, she begins to paint pictures like these. These were inspired by trips to Lake George where his family was. And so we've got these kind of tranquil land landscapes that, um, you know, emphasize the reflection on this very still lake here. We've got these lovely sort of organic lines uh, of the mountains in each of them. And things are sort of soft, sort of sensual, but they're certainly about design and composition. We see um, that extension of Arthur Wesley Dow's philosophies coming into fruition with works like this. So in 1923, um, Alfred Stieglitz launches uh, an exhibition of her work. And just to give you a sense of the power dynamic there, the exhibition, the title of the exhibition is Alfred Stieglitz Presents, da 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 da, works by Georgia O'Keeffe. <laughs> So it really kind of starts with him in so many ways. The following year, his divorce is finally finalized and the two of them can be together legally. Now, before we turn our attention away from this couple, uh, what I wanted to just note quickly is that, uh, and, and I think it can be very clearly seen with images like this. This is white and blue flower shapes from 1919. Over here on the left, this is from the George O'Keefe Museum. And over on the right is Jack in the Pulpit 4, which is at the National Gallery of Art. Now, it's worth noting that in 1919, Alfred Stieglitz was the one who started to promote the idea that Georgia O'Keeffe's flower paintings are not just about flowers. And this is an idea that, um, that certainly lingers to this day. Uh, I, I can tell you firsthand experience when I'm standing in a room um, with people and I show images like this. I mean, this can make a room full of adults blush when they start looking at these pictures. But Georgia O'Keeffe, uh, 
vehemently denied that that's what these pictures were about. And she denied it for six decades. So it brings up this greater question in terms of whose opinions matter, who gets to produce knowledge, and, um, and, and sort of what the power dynamic is in the art world, and <laughs> let's face it, in this relationship too. This is a great photograph of them from 1939 by the photographer Ansel Adams. So we will be getting back to this very interesting partnership. We'll sort of touch base with it throughout the program. But for now, let's turn our attentions to um, uh, George O'Keefe and the images that she produced in New York City just following their marriage. Now, it's important to note that New York City was um, kind of exploding in terms of uh, building and architecture at this time. And Georgia O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz moved to the 30th floor of the Shelton Hotel in New York City. Um, building was going crazy, but the previous year, the Shelton was actually the tallest building in the world. So they're living in um, this rarefied um, period of history. I mean, there weren't other American artists living that high up off the ground. And so Georgia O'Keeffe, over the decade of the 1920s, produces a number of pictures of New York City skyscrapers. Interestingly enough, most of them are from the vantage point of being on the ground or looking directly out at, at a skyscraper. Very rarely does she kind of look down from her apartment. Um, all right, so let's turn our attention to this first image, which I just love so much. This is um, painted in 1925, and the title of the work is New York Street with Moon. This is in a collection in Madrid, Spain. So um, before we talk about the image itself, I just wanna share a brief anecdote, which sort of speaks to, again, to this power dynamic that existed in, in the couple's marriage. Uh, George O'Keefe, produced this painting and, um, and wanted it included in a group exhibition. And her husband flat out rejected it. He said, even male artists are struggling to create images of skyscrapers. Um, this, you know, these are new forms and, and artists hadn't figured it out yet. So he said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to include this work essentially you should stick to the flowers. The following year, this work was included in a group exhibition and it immediately sold for $1,200. And Georgia O'Keeffe wrote about this experience years later. And she said, you know, to paraphrase something akin to, after that, they let me paint skyscrapers. So let's talk a little bit about what she's doing with this work. We are looking up at these huge buildings um, sort of looming over us. And I feel like I can say looming because each one of them has this this curved cornice, which sort of comes over into our space. But notice how they are monolithic. There's no windows, there's no doors. Um, I, I think they're a little bit oppressive. If we look down the street, we can see the sun is setting. There's this orange light and there is a church spire. And it's almost as though the sun is setting. The, the era of this older architecture is gone. And now we're moving into this kind of uncertain and maybe even slightly scary era where, um, where we've got these massive buildings and this kind of cool electric light here, which is almost right at the center of the picture. She... Um, she provides some visual interest and a little bit of relief from all of these hard edges in the night sky. We've got the moon sort of echoing these colors, these forms down below, but these rippling clouds uh, provide this kind of softness, even uh, a reference perhaps to the, to the flower paintings as well. And this was um, a relationship of forms that she was always trying to figure out during the 1920s. This, this relationship between these hard edges and, and the soft forms that she naturally gravitated towards. So the following year, she painted the building where she and Alfred Stieglitz were living. Uh, this is the Shelton with sunspots. And so once again, we see a giant building. It's monolithic in form. It does have a few uh, rectangular windows here, but it's almost as though she's added them in for like a little bit of visual interest. Uh, certainly this building had a lot more windows. <laughs> and then she shows the sun sort of peeking out from around the edge here, but also kind of taking a bite out of this building. Uh, once again, she softens everything with the steam and the sense of movement um, surrounding the building itself. And I also think that all of these golden orbs, the sunspots, that um, visual distortion that we see when we look up at the sun is another sort of 
a great visual interest here, but another way to soften and provide a little bit of a visual variety in a picture like this. It's such a great picture of, um, of a skyscraper. It so reminds me too of like, you know, your first experience in New York City where you can't help but look up. <laughs> and it really is so awe-inspiring. And I'm sure particularly in the 1920s, everybody was looking up. This is just a quick reminder that it was just a decade before at UVA that she was developing this interest in abstraction, simplified forms, the emphasis on, on symmetry. And we can see this all playing out in her New York City paintings. This next work is um, in the collection of the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and it's called City Night from 1923. Now this is a really kind of different picture, right? This is, I would say this is overtly ominous. <laughs> so, um, so what we have here are really tall buildings, looming tall buildings, that if they were to continue to extend beyond these, um, these lines at the top, there would be a vertical convergence here. There's a distortion to, um, to the way we see them. And that distortion actually comes from photography. If, if you were to take a camera at the time and point it up like this, it would make it look as though these buildings would eventually kind of meet each other somewhere in the sky. But of course, it adds this sense of dread to a picture like this, um, particularly the fact that these are, you know, windowless buildings, they're almost solid black here. Uh, she, and once again, she provides just a little bit of relief with, a, with a, a star, a moon, what I think is a moon, that might be an electrical light, and, and certainly what is another electrical light here. Now, it's worth noting too, what is the style that she's painting in? It's called precision. Visionism, in many ways, it almost looks like a commercial painting, right? You don't really see much evidence of the hand of the artist. There's a smoothness to this. There's an exactness to this. This couldn't be more different than, say, Impressionism. Another American artist, Child Hassam, painted this view of New York City from just a decade earlier. And we can see it's all about broken, visible brushstrokes. And, um, and over here, you almost get the sense that Georgia O'Keeffe is trying to, like, disappear in, in the, 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 these black buildings here. All right, so we do have at least one painting here of Georgia O'Keeffe looking down on Manhattan, looking down on the East River in this case, from her um, rarefied view in the Shelton Hotel. On the left is a photograph by her husband, of one scene and on the right is a painting that she produced of uh, virtually the exact same spot. Now, I believe her husband took the photograph first. And it's sort of interesting to think, you know, who inspired who. But um, but I think because her color palette changes so so much here and she's working in these gray tones, it's I would say, think it's very likely that she was working um, sort of in tandem with with the photographs that he was taking at this time. I have to say, you know, she's um, she's reverted to a, a horizontal orientation for her canvas. There's just something about this picture. It doesn't sing for me the way these skyscraper paintings do. It's like she's trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Um, but what these two works together show us is that sometimes for this couple, their work was sort of in dialogue. And, um, and even if they were on the same page artistically at this point, um, in terms of their marriage, they were not. At this point, Georgia O'Keeffe had expressed to her husband that she was ready to have kids, wanted to have kids. She was in her, um, I think, mid thirties by this point. And her husband, who's 23 years older, said, absolutely not. Um, he already had an adult daughter from his, his first marriage and, um, and he was just done having kids. And we know um, from our own experiences in, you know, in, in our own lives, we know that, um, that decisions like this uh, are, are, um, are deal breakers or can be deal breakers in marriage. So this provided a lot of big cracks in the relationship sort of early on. And I think it's interesting, the same view, Georgia O'Keeffe revisits it about a year later and um, sort of outside of the influence of her husband. And I think she she makes it much more interesting. Uh, we've got this, this symmetry here. Um, with the, with the sun in the sky, we've got the sunspots, we've got the color in the water. She just adds her, um, uh, artistic 
perspective to this and makes it much more interesting to look at. This is in the collection of the Jer New Jersey State Museum. So we'll end our view of New York with what is generally considered to be her best New York City painting. This is called the Radiator Building from 1927. And we're sort of looking at the skyscraper head on. And it's worth mentioning here too, that even though, even as you know, these buildings were new forms, artists were even sort of struggling to find ways to depict them, that um, that they function as symbols of success in, in um, the roaring 20s in New York City. You know, I mean, each new tall building was, um, was uh, you know, a testament to uh, American ingenuity, essentially. So these are, these are all celebrations. Uh, this is uh, a, just a wonderful work. And in so many ways, it's like an abstract work. You can almost imagine cutting it in half. And, um, and then it just looks like a, a, an abstract painting. It's just this really sort of interesting collection of uh, white and, and, and yellow uh, uh, rectangles. And then down below the, the white orbs of electric street lamps, but up above seems to be these references to her and her relationships, or her relationship with her husband. Um, of course, at the top of the radiator building is this really interesting architectural design, sort of art deco, neo-gothic. But over here on the left, you can see she's put her husband's name in red neon letters over here. They did not, they were never in, in red neon letters on the top of a building in New York City, but she's certainly celebrating him here. And, um, and this picture is often kind of considered a double portrait of the two of them. And many art historians think that this form on top of the radiator building is somehow a reference to Georgia O'Keeffe. But for me, it's really this kind of wisp of steam coming off the top of this building on the right that reminds me of her. It reminds me of the undulating lines of her flower paintings and her abstract paintings from this time. Um, this interesting play of the blue and the green from this kind of spotlight effect over here. And it would makes sense to kind of balance um, the portrait of her husband with a, a, some sort of reference to herself over here. It's really interesting. So just a few years later, the stock market crashes. Um, and these symbols of American success, these skyscrapers become symbols of failure. Uh, she doesn't want to paint them anymore. 1929 becomes a really consequential year in her life too, because she heads out to New Mexico. She'd been there once when she was much younger, but this big trip that she takes with um, a few friends uh, really had a profound effect on her life. It and her her artistic development, essentially her work becomes sort of cleaner, sharper. She said, I loved it immediately. And from then on, I was always on my way back. So let's take a look at what New Mexico looks like for Georgia O'Keeffe. This is her painting called um, Black Mesa Landscape, New Mexico uh, from 1930. And let's just kind of walk through this landscape together for a moment. We start off with this kind of thin row of green trees. Look at how abstracted they are. She's not um, giving us really any detail about them, just a few suggestions of tree trunks here. Just beyond it is this kind of peachy orange hill that has all of these ravines um, carved into it. And the more I look at it, the sort of softer and fleshier it looks to me. Um, I think of the desert as being like all these hard edges and she's transformed it into something almost sensual there. And then just beyond it, these wonderful colors, we've got some purple, the black, and then these wonderful like lavender and periwinkle colors in the mountains beyond. So she was so drawn to these spaces. She was drawn to the color. And, um, and here she's kind of putting this precisionist style in service of the natural scenery here. And, um, and it kind of opens up uh, all the possibilities for her artwork. She finds her place here in a way um, that she never felt like she had in New York City. She said, when I got to New Mexico, that was mine. As soon as I saw it, this, that was my country. I'd never seen anything like it before, but it fitted to me exactly. Don't we all long to find a place that fits to us exactly? So, um, so she painted this one church in New Mexico several times. It's called Rancho's Church. This is from 1929 and it's at the Norton Museum of Art. And this was her, um, 
this was her sort of exploring architecture and its relationship to the land and finding what was for her a really kind of satisfying resolution. This was what she was struggling with all through the 20s, looking at these skyscraper forms. Here, we're looking at the back of this adobe style church. Um, so this would have been sort of like a, a, almost like where the apse of the church is. And this is a wall extending past um, a, alongside the front of the church. But it's, it's, it's not really clear what we're looking at when we first look at it. If you don't have any context, it's, um, it almost feels like you're looking at a natural rock outcropping. You don't really know where the land ends and where the church begins. And so this kind of harmonizing of architecture and landscape was, um, was I mean, th this is what she had been searching for. So there was a real joy in finding forms like this. Georgia O'Keeffe also began to paint a lot of crosses during this time. Um, this is Black Cross, New Mexico from 1929 from the Art Institute of Chicago over here on the left. And then the absolutely lovely Black Cross with um, stars in blue also from the same year. Um, she said, I saw the crosses so often and often in unexpected places like a thin dark veil of the Catholic Church spread over the New Mexico landscape. Now she's somebody who um, she like loved symbolism, but also denied symbolism. But I think these are just really strong forms that could anchor her compositions and provide some visual interest. I mean, look at how she's using this horizontal bar here to um, focus our view on, on uh, that sunset. Uh, one art historian described all these little hills in the background as looking like a, a massive herd of elephants. And I don't think I've ever seen it differently, but we have also got, um, the the round pegs in each of these uh black crosses so they serve as monoliths but they're also softened that way over here uh, we've got this exquisite blue color and it, once again this kind of softening with the starlight here it's um it's kind of the visual uh, relief, the visual um, satisfaction that she'd been looking for in New York City but hadn't quite achieved. Now, one of her most famous paintings from her time in New Mexico is the Lawrence Tree, also from 1929. She and her friends went to visit the author D.H. Lawrence, who was um, pretty well known for writing about the dehumanizing effects of modernity and industrialization. So you can imagine he and George O'Keefe were right on the same page. And just outside of his cabin in New Mexico was this huge ponderosa pine. And George O'Keefe laid, laid down on a bench um, just below the tree and looked up at it and essentially came up with the idea for this composition, this really sort of stunning composition where we see the tree trunk looming over at us at this really strong diagonal, almost like a 45 degree angle here. Um, the branches of the pine sort of fan out like octopus legs. And then we look through the pine needles here to see the starlight just beyond. And I think that this picture has this incredible power to make us all feel uh, or remind us of the feeling of being outside, being so close and connected to nature, of being able to take a deep breath and smell the outdoors and to like feel the sensation of the outdoors, that communing with nature that, um, that we simply don't have enough of in this life. This incredible picture, I think, provides that for us. Um, the perspective here really reminds me of some of her the perspectives that she provided while in New York City. But interestingly enough, she was not wedded to one way of looking at this picture. So I will save you the trouble of Googling it. Um, here's a little Google uh, <laughs> results. If you look up this picture, you can see that Google returns all these different ways of, of orienting this picture, the tree trunk hanging from the top, from the other side. Uh, the institution that owns it is the Wadsworth Athenaeum down in Hartford, Connecticut. And they actually hang it upside down like this. <laughs> uh, but George O'Keefe approved of it. She thought it was great. She thought it really worked that way. So we're going to take a quick pause on the work she was producing and turn our attention back to her marriage because once she started going to um, 
to the Southwest. It was a habit that she um, that she maintained every year. She would spend several months of the year in New Mexico. And so what she would do while she was away was obviously write a lot to her husband. Letter writing was always a part of their love language, but she would also create these little love notes and, um, and hide them throughout their apartment in New York City. And what's really sort of endearing is that her husband, Alfred, uh, would find them and, um, and and then make a little note of where he found them and what the date was. So you can see down below, he wrote, found in my slippers, and um, it includes the date, which I think is 1943. So, um, so there's this kind of sweetness and affection in the relationship that is really endearing. But, um, but things were not well, <laughs> to say the least. Alfred Stieglitz um, actually started up an open affair with another woman named Dorothy Norman. And we see her here photographed by Stieglitz on the left. He started the affair in 1927. So even a few years before George O'Keefe started going out to New Mexico. Um, and Dorothy Norman was only um, 21 years old when the affair started and she was also married. So um, he, she began to play this um, larger, increasingly large role in Alfred Stieglitz's uh, professional career. She would help to manage his gallery. She was helping to manage his body of work. And so she took up a lot of his life and it caused a lot of depression for Georgia O'Keeffe. She was... Um, developing all sorts of kind of uh, neurotic uh, uh, reactions to what was happening in her life. She uh, had trouble eating and sleeping. She developed a fear of water, water. So you can imagine going to the Southwest would be ideal. She also developed a fear of, um, of buildings collapsing on top of her. So it sort of seems like escaping New York would have been a great thing for her. So, um, so Ultimately, she has a nervous breakdown in 1933 uh, as a result of, of this uh, affair that her husband was having. And at that point, I mean, he'd been having it for what, six years. She was hospitalized for two months and then um, took some more time after that to recover. Um, incidentally, her husband did not end the affair. The affair did not end until her husband's passing. Um, more than a decade later. So this mental breakdown was sort of a breakthrough for Georgia O'Keeffe. It allowed her to redefine herself following this and, um, and not just how she saw herself, but, um, but how she created work in New Mexico. So, um, so we also see that during this period, she pushes away from her husband's control of her. Now she begins to paint <laughs> beyond flowers. One of the things that, that she's best known for painting is animal bones. And so we're looking at two animal skulls here, um, obviously painted in the Southwest. These are both works from the mid 1930s um, after following the breakdown. Uh, one on the left is from the Whitney Museum. The one on the right is from the Brooklyn Museum of Art. These are strange paintings. Um, they could almost be seen as surrealist. We've got these giant animal skulls floating in the air above this kind of miniature southwestern landscape in each of them. And both of them have almost like a garnish of, of a beautiful flower next to them. And for Georgia O'Keeffe, she talked about uh, the, creating these works. She just kind of started with the skull and then she would just keep adding things as she saw them or as she passed by them she, and became kind of interested in them. Many people have said, oh, well, these works kind of look surrealist. And I think a few of them were actually exhibited with surrealists um, early on. But she, that was before she even really knew what surrealism was. Later on, she was asked, are you a surrealist artist? And I just absolutely love her answer because I feel like it provides a lot of insight into her personality. Her response was, I'm not a joiner. <laughs> so we can, we can gather a lot from that response. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe fell in love with these animal bones, I think in part because they, there's a lot of interest here. There's interesting lines, interesting forms, cavities, um, uh, all sorts of, of ways to kind of approach the subject matter. But essentially she thought of them 
as like the flowers of the Southwest. She would actually go through the desert and pick up animal bones the same way that somebody might pick flowers in a meadow. This is another photograph of her by Ansel Adams. Look at how happy she is. She Here she is picking up not just bones, but an animal head here that is not that still has flesh on it. But she's so happy she found it and then she gets to bring it home and, it, and it's all integrated into her life um, over the following decades. The bones are, are here for her. In the early 1940s, she does a series of pictures on, um, on just animal pelvic bones and kind of looking through them at, um, at these little slices of perfect blue sky. She once wrote something like, I could, I could even live in a jail just as long as I had a little slice of blue sky. So these are incredibly important works. This one is at the Indianapolis Museum. This one's at the Metropolitan Museum. And this one over here on the right is at the O'Keeffe Museum. So so what are these pictures about? Well, first of all, they are really sort of pressing the boundary of what is a realistic depiction of something and what is abstraction. She is falling in love with these forms because they provide this kind of abstract of frame of, of this blue sky. Um, in fact, one art historian framed this in, in such lovely in such lovely terms. She wrote that these pictures are about looking at the universe through the portal of a bone. I just love that. It's so elegant. Um, but essentially, she's using these pelvic bones in the same way that she did flowers. She's zooming us in <laughs> and, um, and she's cropping them. She's making them monumental. She's making us think about them and look at them in a way that maybe we had never done before. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe said her bone paintings were not about death. The flowers were not about sex and the bones are not about death. But there is at least one bone painting that she did that is about death. This is just called Head with a Broken Pot from 1943. And, um, and I'm mostly just showing this to you to use as a segue to a death that's in her family. Just a few years later, um, in 1946, Alfred Stieglitz suffers a heart attack. Uh, George O'Keefe is in um, uh, New Mexico at the time. She drops everything. She heads back to New York City to be with him. And, um, and a few days later, he passes away. And immediately upon his passing, Georgia O'Keeffe takes back control of virtually every aspect of his professional career. Um, all these things that had been ma managed by Dorothy Norman, um, his mistress in the meantime. So his gallery, his body of work, she takes it all back. And she also takes about three years to settle his estate. And in doing so, she does things like donates uh, more than 1500 images, I think it was, to the National Gallery of Art and thereby kind of um, cementing his legacy and, and the contribution of, of his work um, and, uh, uh, and, and his photographic work in the history of art. So it's really interesting to think that this woman who had been pushing away, pushing at his control over her career for decades, gets the chance to sort of make the final say when it comes to his career. So like I said, she takes three years to do this. And during that time, she's kind of moving around a little bit because because she had decided to buy and renovate this the ruins of this old hacienda in New Mexico. These are two photographs of the ruins. This is a photograph of her from 1948. So this is about how old she is as she does this. She said she absolutely had to buy this property because there was a patio door um, there. And she said she would have no peace until she painted it. Um, so just to give you a sense in terms of how well she's doing in her life, uh, financially at least, this uh, this property is 5,000 square feet <laughs> and she was going to live there all by herself. She gets it completely renovated. This is what it looks like after it's renovated. Here we are sort of peeking through these paint play, uh, uh, plate glass windows into her bedroom. When we stand inside her bedroom, we can see that those windows frame up that desert landscape in such a wonderful way. I mean, it almost makes me want to sit down and start painting it too. Um, here's just another view uh, through these incredible windows that she had. We sort of get the sense that she lived kind of simply. Notice her rock collection inside on the windowsill here. She had this profound connection to nature. So, um, so it makes sense to frame up a view like that. 
Now, in the short time that we have left, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her experience with a few other art forms very quickly. Now, we'll start off with photography. George O'Keefe was one of the most photographed women of the 20th century. And let's not forget that her, um, that her career was launched with photographs of herself. And so she was very conscious in terms of crafting a persona in the second part of her career and the second part of her life, really. So this is a photograph of her that was in Vogue magazine. This was Life magazine. She had um, a really uh, sort of stunning sense of, of, of style, at, but she would always portray herself as, as very serious in these photographs. And, um, and I think in some ways to kind of balance out uh, how she was introduced to the world and also to negate um, any sort of question as to whether or not she's a serious artist, you know, because that's always raised when you're a woman and she just wanted to be an artist and to be taken seriously. Now, Perhaps because of these serious photos, she developed a little bit of a reputation of being a crabby old hermit. <laughs> uh, but take a look at how her demeanor changes when she gets behind a camera. Her photo, uh, her um, photography friend Todd Webb said the day she got her first Polaroid camera, she was like a kid at Christmas. So obviously she was familiar with cameras. She was married to a professional photographer herself, but beginning in the 1960s and into the 70s, when she began taking photographs, she just experienced this, um, this new joy in her life doing it. And she and her photographer friends would walk through the desert together and they would snap pictures along the way. This almost replaced picking up bones for her. And, and it's another interesting way of like keeping a little piece of the landscape, like picking a flower um, as, as you're moving through it. So what would she do with these photographs? For, for Georgia O'Keeffe, she was never interested in creating perfect prints of her photographs in the way maybe a professional photographer would be. And even they weren't a necessarily um, important part of her artistic process. Um, this is a painting she created in 1932 called Jimson Weed. This is a photograph of the same flower from almost three decades later. You can imagine that she's just kind of having fun, zooming in, cropping, making something monumental, and maybe even a little bit in awe that, you know, this process can be done through the lens of a camera as opposed to, you know, this steady work at, at a canvas. So, um, she would take photographs of the same thing again and again and again, again from slightly different vantage points. The things that she loved to paint, she also photographed. So that patio door that she fell in love with at her property, she photographed it and she also painted it. I incidentally, I love these paintings. These are from the 1950s. This is door through the window and this is um, a black door with snow. So, um, so as she's photographing it, she's also producing like nearly two dozen paintings of this one door. So, um, so what would she do with all these uh, photographs that she was taking? Uh, she would make contact sheets, essentially just uh, print out the negatives and, um, and she would give them to friends or she would use them as bookmarks. These weren't works of fine art to her per se, but they were fun experiments. I, I particularly love this uh, image over here on the right where the shadow from the ladder is drawing our eye down to what I believe is a pile of bones. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a pile of bones. So she's working in photography. She's having fun in photography. She's also dabbling a little bit in sculpture. She has just a few sculptural forms to, to her name. The first is um, created in the 19 teens, shortly after her connection with um with Alfred Stieglitz, I almost get the sense that he was encouraging her to develop work in a variety of media, but you can sort of see that there's a nice visual connection to some of her drawings from this time. But I also read that, um, that she created this sculpture, and I should mention that this is a white lacquered bronze sculpture. She would have created the maquette or the form for it, and then somebody else would have cast it in bronze. I read that she created this form just after her mother's death, and that you can sort of understand it then as like a veiled mourner, somebody whose head is hanging low in grief. And it, it, to me, it looks so powerful because of that. 
Her other um, significant sculptural form is simply called abstraction and it's from 1946. It's also bronze and, um, and it's typically lacquered in white and it comes in a variety of sizes. And it's sort of a spiral, it's really a circle with a loop around it that then sort of loops back on itself. But she is kind of taken with this looping form. She goes back to it a lot in her paintings, whether it's flowers over here on the left or um, or nautilus shell on the right. Uh, I mentioned it comes in different sizes. It gets as big as 118 inches. These are two wonderful photographs of her with this sculpture. I don't know where any of the large ones are. So if anybody on tonight has ever seen one of these, please let me know. Um, but she really knew how to pose for the camera here, didn't she? So I think you can sort of think of these sculptures as what she was doing with the pelvic bones. I mean, the, the form is so similar in so many ways, but she was creating a three-dimensional form that you can look at and look through simultaneously. Now we're going to wrap up her, um, her experiments in a variety of media with a huge scandal that bookends the big romantic scandal that her career started with. This is a man named Juan Hamilton who came into her life in her final decades and um, he really pushed to be in her life. He's kind of started off as a handyman, um, but then his background in, um, in pottery uh, eventually created this, this bond between them. And he introduced pottery to Georgia O'Keeffe when she was 83 years old. They began working in pottery together, but he also became her companion. There was a lot of chatter as to what the true nature of this relationship was. She was 58 years older than him, uh, but he would travel with her. I mean, they were, they were together all the time. They were um, a very similar mind. So here's a, a photograph of her working in clay. Here's an example of one of her uh, one of her pots. And you can see it really reminds me of like the stone forms that she was already so drawn to. I mean, she was a woman who had, you know, a whole collection of her favorite rocks. And they tended to be these kind of smooth yet imperfect forms. And I think you can really see that in her pottery work as well. Well, there isn't a ton of it, but um, but you can imagine this was a form that was really satisfying to her um, in her 80s, probably into her 90s as well, because her eyesight was failing. So um, so I should mention too that when Georgia O'Keeffe died, uh, her estate was worth seventy six million dollars. This is somebody who was very savvy about managing her career and her money, and she gave almost all of it to Juan Hamilton. It was quite the scandal. He ended up donating most of it back to the Georgia O'Keeffe Foundation. He's still a special consultant to that organization, but he said that he wanted to. He didn't want to get by off of uh, off of what she had given him. He said uh, he wanted to get by on his work and his wits. Um, of course, people were were pretty horrified even at the notion that he would take any of that money. So um, it certainly prompted a lot of interesting conversations about estate planning. <laughs> so here she is, she's in her 80s, she's in her 90s. Let's take a look at just a few of her last works. Um, I mentioned before that her eyesight was failing. She was actually suffering from macular degeneration as early as the 1970s. Uh, these are works that were done in the 70s, just these simple abstractions in watercolor. Every time I look at these, I just wanna go out and buy watercolor set so so badly because she makes it look easy and these are just such you know stunning and simple compositions they're just lovely kind of experiments in form here now because Georgia O'Keeffe had this very long life and this very long career she had the benefit of being celebrated while she was still alive she received the presidential medal of freedom from Gerald Ford in 1977 um, that is the highest honor awarded to any American citizen she also received the National Medal of Arts from Reagan in 1985. But of course, in the 1970s, there's this new wave of feminism and women artists who are looking back at the trailblazers. And so you can see in a feminist work like this, that's actually in the collection of the Smithsonian Museum, uh, the artist here, Mary Beth Edelson, 
puts Georgia O'Keeffe right at the center of the action in this kind of send up of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. I mean, she makes Georgia O'Keeffe Jesus. <laughs> Georgia O'Keeffe is sort of the be all end all. Judy Chicago, who um, created the famous dinner party uh, in 1979 that's at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, this huge banquet table with uh, individualized place settings for uh, famous women in history and famous women in art, in addition to having all these names of of, um, of other women in history uh, included. Well, Georgia O'Keeffe gets her, her own place setting here and uh, it has references to her paintings, certainly uh, references to the most erotic parts of her paintings. And then down here in, um, in the stitching, on the, the tablecloth here, they've included some of the animal bones as well. So a, a nice way to pay homage to her. One last artist here who's paying homage to George O'Keefe. This was uh, a more recent work from 2007. The artist is David P. Bradley, and this is at the Denver Art Museum. This is like such a great summary of her career. So it is um, O'Keefe after Whistler's mother, the famous painting by, um, James McNeil Whistler of his mother in profile. But here, oh, sorry, she's surrounded by all of her favorite things, the flowers, the church over here, the rocks, um, the crosses, the mesas. It kind of captures so much of who she is. Plus she had this style where she really liked to wear black and white. Now, even in her last few years, in her mid nineties, Georgia O'Keeffe, who was, you know, a, a little bit of a recluse, still was living the good life. She was hanging hanging out with uh, Andy Warhol um, frequently. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, she's being celebrated. She's got friends in, in high places. She passes away um, in 1986 at the age of 98. What a life. Think of all the things that she saw during that time. Um, she, her body was cremated and her ashes were scattered at one of her homes um, in New Mexico. 11 years later, uh, the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum was founded. That's in Santa Fe. This is a little display that they have of her materials inside the museum. I've never been to Santa Fe, but this is definitely on my bucket list now. And I always think it's interesting to know how work does at auction. Georgia O'Keeffe Keith's uh, painting uh, sells at higher prices than any other woman artist of all time. And this painting, the Jimson Weed that we saw before, was sold in 2014 for the record price of $44 million. And that sounds pretty amazing, doesn't it? But George O'Keefe's friend, Andy Warhol, has sold many works at auction since his death for well over $100 million. So even after death, women artists are just still not... Um, not finding any sense of equality with male artists, <laughs> but we'll end on a happier note. We'll end looking at Georgia O'Keeffe, thinking about this extraordinary life that she that she had, um, this eight decade long career, um, you know, struggling through a male dominated uh, career, thriving through it, but then also being able to carve out the life she desired um, out in the desert. So um, she created so many iconic works, so many that are still beloved today, it would be doing her career a disservice if we only thought she was about flowers. So I will end there and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about Georgia O'Keeffe. Thank you. Wow. I just have a brand new appreciation for her. That's oh, good. So <laughs> fascinating. All the work she did over her life. I didn't realize she had lived such a long life. What wow. a life, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are a couple of comments in chat. I don't, can you can see those, can't you? Actually, I cannot see. Oh, wait. Yes, I can. Ooh. Sorry. All right. Okay. Um, thank you for the kind words here. Okay. And somebody said, was he part of arts and crafts movement Dow. Um, I think you can make that case. Uh, there's a great little display about his work that's at the Addison Gallery um, on the campus of Phillips Academy in Andover right now. And it's in conjunction with a small exhibition of George O'Keeffe's photographs. So you can learn a little bit more about his work. Um, I, I think you could call it, yeah, it was, it's like right on the cusp of, of um, like the end of Art Nouveau, the beginning of arts and crafts. I, I think you're right about that. That's, that's um, a good question to ask. Let's see here. 
And then, oh, everybody, thank you for your kind words. That means a lot to me. It was really fun to, um, for me to do the research on, on her and to get to know her a little bit better. I, at the end of these, I always feel like I know with the artist, you know, you feel like you have a good sense in, in terms of who they are. And certainly when I started the research on this, I was like, who is she? But I don't know, there was something about that line where she just said, I'm not a joiner. I just like fell in love with her then. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. She was very individual. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Good for her. Uh, we did record it and Jane did say that we could post it. Um, so we'll have it up on our YouTube channel um, in a couple of days. So um, that's the Dover Public Library's YouTube channel. So you can, I'll send out a, a message to everybody who registered so that those that didn't make it could could watch it too as well. So Thank you, Jane, for um, allowing us to record it and for this wonderful presentation. Um, I didn't notice you had a cold at all. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, she's gonna have to drink. She's gonna have to drink. <laughs> Good job. And Jane will be back with us again in September um, doing Botticelli. So uh, I very much look forward to that. And I hope you will too, so. Um, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Good night. Thank you.